you, darling. Oh, I don't get that every morning. I wish I did. That would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> I should preach more often. Right, before I start, I'd love you to turn to the person next to you and tell them one thing that you're really grateful for and thankful for this week. Can we do that? Go for it. All right. I've got two things that I'm thankful for this morning, and I'm going to share them with you. Yesterday, my little girl had her birthday party. She turned nine years old, and I'm grateful that I live to tell the story. I can stand before you now and say I survived eight little girls. You know, women are complicated. You know, boys, when they have a... Yeah. When they have an argument, they just get their fists out, a little bit of punches, maybe some blood, and then it's over and done with. But girls are just a whole nother story. So I'm, I'm here to say I survived the birthday party. I'm also grateful for my very good-looking parents that are here this morning because they survived three girls. So they deserve a crown of glory. So I just want to say thank you, Mommy and Daddy, for being here. It's so special to me. They're these amazing people over here. Just honor them. Yay! Right. Can we all turn to Exodus 8, verse 1 to about 12? We're going to read out of the Word today. Of course. And while you're turning there, I'm going to pray. Father God, I just thank you that you're a good God. I thank you that we become whole in your presence. I thank you, Father, that when we read your word, it comes dripping with grace and mercy, that you never bring shame, you never bring blame, and that you're a good, good daddy. Amen. Okay, are we all in Exodus? Okay, here we go. I'm going to read for you. Then the Lord said to Moses, go back to Pharaoh and announce to him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs across your entire land. The Nile River will swarm with frogs. They will come up out of the river, into your palace, even into your bedroom and onto your bed. Yikes. They will enter the houses of your officials and your people. They will even jump into your ovens and your kneading bowls. Frogs will jump on your people and on all of your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, raise the staff in your hand over all the rivers, canals, the ponds of Egypt, and bring up frogs over the land. So Aaron raised his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the whole land. But the magicians were able to do the same thing with their magic. They too caused frogs to come up on the land of, of Egypt. Now this I find funny. I love the way the devil tries to imitate what God is doing, but this is really stupid. I mean, there's enough frogs as there is, and they call up more frogs. So that kind of made me laugh. Then um, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and begged. He said, plead with the Lord your God to take these frogs away from me and my people. I will let your people go so they can offer sacrifices to the Lord. You set the time. Moses replied, tell me when you want me to pray for you and your officials and your people. Then you and your houses will be rid of the frogs. They will remain only in the Nile River. Do it tomorrow, Pharaoh said. All right, Moses replied. It will be as you have said. Then you will know that there is no other one like the Lord your God. And we know the rest of the story. The frogs leave and, um, and then the next play comes. So, for some of you, this is a familiar story, but a little bit of background. For about 430 years, the children of Israel have been in bondage and in captivity within the land of Egypt under the rule of a tyrant, Pharaoh, and they're crying out to the Lord, and the Lord sends a deliverer um, in the man of 
in, in, in the man of Moses. And he is the negotiator that is now going to negotiate with Pharaoh about how to let the, the people of Israel go. And as I said, for some, we've read the story many times. There's been various movies made on it. I think at one point we knew the whole soundtrack for The Prince of Egypt, um, which is a great rendition of the story. I wouldn't recommend watching Exodus with Russell Crowe. Not such a good rendition of the story. But anyway, finally... The Lord has had enough. He send, he's sending these plagues. And um, every single plague, you, you might not know this, represented one of the Egyptian gods. So it's almost a mockery of what they actually worshipped. And we're going to focus on one plague in particular, and that would be the plague of frogs. Now, as we've just read, frogs are everywhere. Like, you, you just can't imagine how many frogs there are. And, you know, I'm, I'm quite fond of bugs. I quite like you know, I'm not, I don't get too squeamish. One of my favorite bugs is a ladybug. They're pretty, they're cute, they walk on your hand. But there's certain times in the year here in the UK when you can walk out of your front door and there's little clumps of them in the corners. Does anyone else get that in their house? I get, yeah. And, and you know, that's, those little pretty bugs are a little bit more not so pretty when they're in these clams. And then when you have your wellies outside and you're bound to go for a walk and you put your foot in your welly and all of a sudden there's a squeamish squishy sound, you know that the ladybugs have fallen into your welly boot. Now, I can handle ladybugs, but frogs not so much so. They slimy, they release a funny odor, they're not so great. And you can imagine now, for Pharaoh, there would only be one worse thing than a huge amount of frogs in your bed. And that would be a very unhappy, complaining wife wanting him to do something about it. So due to perhaps um, a, dripping a dripping tap scenario, so this is my speaker's license to imagine a bit, Pharaoh calls Moses and he says to Moses, I am so done, I want you to get rid of these frogs. Mate, you've got to help me out here. My, my wife is like in my ear. So Moses says, okay, that's great. God is willing, God is more than able to get rid of these frogs. So when would you like me to talk to my God and ask him to get rid of these frogs? When do you want them to go? And then to me, one of the strangest, if not weirdest verses in the Bible, which has only three words, but we're going to be focusing on just one word in verse 10. Pharaoh says, I want you to talk to your God, but I want you to do it tomorrow. Now, you may not think that's strange, but I would want to ask you the question, what would compel this man to want to spend one more night with those frogs and worse yet, a complaining wife beside him? So I think we've got a picture of the frogs up there. Yeah, you can see they're not the most beautiful of creatures, are they? But really, my question to us today is what are the frogs in you, around you, on you, that you've been carrying for years and years, that God is willing to get rid of. He's more than able to get rid of. But sometimes we come to church week after week. We listen to podcasts. We go to conferences. And please hear what I'm saying here. I love listening to podcasts. I listen to them all the time. I love conferences. I thoroughly enjoyed last weekend. You know what I'm, I'm saying? Like We can listen to teachings and we can think to ourselves... I'm going to do exactly what they said at that conference, what Chris said last week, but I'm going to do it tomorrow. And I'm convinced that a lot of the bondage within the body of Christ is because most of us think that because we thought we would do something about it, then we've actually done something about it. Or we sit there and we say, I'm going to do something about it. I will do something about it, but I'll do it tomorrow. And we have a world of believers that are waiting, that we have a world that is waiting for believers to actually believe that today God can set us free, that today God can deliver us, that today can, God can do what his word says it can do. And then we have a whole bunch of Christians who are saying, tomorrow. You see, it's kind of how we are as people. You know, at the, at the beginning of every year, we, we have our New Year's resolutions, and we say to ourselves, this is going to be the year that I have that tone physique. This is going to be the year that I'm going to go to gym, and I'm going to get my six-pack, and I'm going to be, like, super fit. And so we set our alarm clock 
for tomorrow morning. And then tomorrow morning comes at, say, 5.30, and the alarm clock goes off, and we say, get behind me, <laughs> Satan. <laughs> no, not quite like that. But I'll go tomorrow. I'll start the gym tomorrow. You know, I'm going to have that healthy eating plan that I always said I was going to have. And look, this is me. I'm preaching to me here because the amount of times I've said I'm going to cut our coffee, Jackie and I tried to do it. I think I lasted two days. And then I phoned up and I said, I fell. I have my coffee. Or we decide I'm going to cut out sugar. But I'm going to have that last tub of Ben and Jerry's. And then I'm just going to start tomorrow. This is definitely me. So I'm just saying. I'm going to deal with that issue in my marriage but I'll go to the lamb course the next time it comes round. I'm going to start tithing, but I'll, I'll do it next Sunday. I'll do it tomorrow. And so many of us never step into our God-given destiny, purpose, and potential because we live in this eternal state of, I'll do it tomorrow. You could actually get rid of that. It's quite disturbing. If it's disturbing people, we can get rid of that right now. <laughs> And so we carry all of these frogs of yesterday into our today, and we never step into our tomorrow because our life becomes one big yesterday lived in this present moment because we won't deal with our frogs, we won't deal with our stuff. We try to blame others, we put off things, and yet we never see tomorrow. We talk about this eternal one day where we'll step into everything that God has for me, and I'm going to do that, but then we never deal with our yesterday's frogs today. Because guess what? When you wake up tomorrow, guess what day it is? Today. And we keep talking about this tomorrow that never comes because we refuse to do anything today. And where you deal with yesterday's frogs is today. Your life will become one big yesterday today unless you choose today that you're going to deal with yesterday. And then you will step in your to tomorrow and your destiny and your purposes that the Father has for your life. It's the only way it ever works. I mean, look at the children of Israel. I don't think I can get it again. <laughs> look at the children of Israel. They spent 40 years mumbling and complaining. And it wasn't even that generation that walked into the promised land, but it took 40 years. And I really believe that we don't have 40 years to put off what God has got for the body of Christ. We really don't. We don't want our lives to become one long replay of a past offense, a past hurt, some past pain, something that happened way past then. And that becomes our excuse that we never step into our tomorrow. We don't want to be stuck in that moment, and yet we don't want to allow God to begin to do the things he wants to do in us today. You see, in any realm of life, it can be amazing to me how many believers don't really believe. How many believers never, ever really apply the truth of God's word? What would it look like if we fully stepped into our identity as believers and applied the word? I heard a story about this, and... Um, I don't know how true it is, but it proves my point quite well. And you'll find when I speak, I do tell a lot of stories. And I was having a chat with the Lord about it the other day. And he said, don't worry about it, Janine. My son did that all the time. So I think that's okay. Um, but this story was an old lady who had worked for some very wealthy people here in the UK, a, a lord and a lady. They own much land. And um, she had literally given her life to serve them. They died, and, and she, she actually landed up, um, she was on her deathbed, and she landed up being very poor in her last days. She never had much. She had spent all of her days working for these people. And so she called in a lawyer because she had a few little things she needed help with because she didn't have any family around her. And she said to him, you know, I would just want you to do one thing for me before I die. Up on the wall is a letter that I received from my employers when um, I left. And um, I've always wanted to read it, but I never learned how to read. Do you think you could read that for me? So the lawyer said, well, no problem. Of course I will. And so he took it off the wall, and his face started to change. And she, she couldn't understand. She goes, what's wrong? And he said, ma'am, do you not realize that this is a will, and you inherited a huge fortune from your employers when they died. And, and yet they were, they'd been sitting up on the wall gathering dust and she was never able to access her inheritance. And for some of us, you know, we can do the same with the word of God. It can sit on the shelf 
our bedside table. It can gather dust. And we never access what our real inheritance is in, as sons and daughters of the King of Kings. So can you imagine what we could accomplish for the kingdom if we really knew that? And just going back again, as I mentioned before, sometimes we don't need another CD, a Christian book, a Bethel podcast. I love all of those. We just need to do the last thing that God told us to do today. And then we will be amazed at how much we step into our freedom tomorrow. I honestly live, I, I really believe that we're living in really urgent times on this earth. And there's no time to keep playing games. At some point, somebody's actually got to say, I believe this. And today I'm going to declare that I'm going to do what God has called me to do. So I realize that for, for, for many of you, this can actually be quite ex painful. This is extremely painful because we don't like to embrace the pain of recovery. Instead, we would rather walk with the limp for the rest of our lives. But I really don't believe that's what the Father's plan is for us. You see, as human beings, we don't like pain. We'll do anything to avoid it. But our biggest promotions will never come with fanfare and accolades, but because you've recognized your purpose within adversity. So pain can be a good thing. Any woman in the room who's had a child, I've had three, and has gone through labor pains. I know some people believe for pain-free labor, that never happened for me, sadly. But anybody who knows the pain of labor, and then that, that sense of holding that baby in your arms and looking into their face... I often say, if I could encapsulate that feeling and put it in a pill and sell it, I'd be a millionaire because it's the most incredible feeling. But you have to go to, through some pain to get there. I had an experience after my labor, interestingly enough, where I, a few days after I had Ethan, who's now 18, I fell down the stairs and hurt my back. And then three years later, the same thing happened after having Finn. And so I landed up with um, a lot of pain within my back. We were in South Africa at the time, and um, I'd gone for a CT scan because I was at the point where I wasn't sleeping at night. They put me on the same pain medication as cancer patients, and the only position that was slightly comfortable was standing on one leg. So it got to the point where they said, look, your L2 and 3 vertebrae is compressing onto a disc, and that was pressing into the nerve canal and, and causing, obviously, a lot of pain. And so I needed to go to full back surgery. Surgery. And because we were in South Africa, we weren't on medical aid, I was on a waiting list, but like the NHS. And um, I was crying out to the Lord one day. I said, God, I just can't go for a back surgery. I'm too young. You know, once you start fusing your spine, it just is a, it goes on and on. And I felt the Lord give me some real pearls of wisdom. He said, Janine, I'm going to heal you. I had that. But I want you to walk and I want you to do Pilates. Now, it's interesting, people had mentioned Pilates before, and, and I just thought, oh, you know, that's just boring. I want to do cardio. I want to sweat. I want to feel like I'm doing something. So I just totally ignored it. But, you know, sometimes when the Lord said something, you, you've got to take notice. And so I was like, I'm sorry, Lord, I, I'll do that. And I, I started a process of regaining my strength and recovering, but it wasn't fun. It was painful. But I didn't want to go for surgery. And God healed me in that process. I came off all my medication. I got the call for surgery. I said, thank you very much. My Jesus has healed me. But I knew that I had to um, do those few things um, to just re keep regaining my strength within my back. And you see, the degree to which you embrace pain is the degree to which you will have your healing. Will it be fast or slow? Will it be complete or partial? Most people who go through surgery, post-surgery physio and rehab won't regain the, mo the movement of their limb because they won't embrace the process of recovery. And, you know, I'm talking about very physical things here, but, you know, there's, there's so much internally that we have to work through. And I just want to stop for a moment and have a little commercial break because James and I this week went to Daryl and Anthea Kirkup for um, a couple sozo. It's the first one they've ever done and they're writing um, a curriculum for it and it's all very exciting. So we were their guinea pigs. So there's no issue with our married. We're all good. You, cannot, you don't have to worry. But we went for the sozo and, you know, we were blown away, blown away by what the Lord brought up. 
you know, the perception is that as leaders, we've got everything together. And I just want to just laugh at that lie right now because of all people, we need to be going for these, th these things all the time to making sure we're in a good, healthy place before the Father. And I'd just really like to encourage you guys. It's the best investment. We know we, we send our cars for an MOT. We clean our houses. We do go to gym. We do all this stuff. But what are we doing for our soul? So that's just my plug for Daryl and Anthea. And there's so, commercial's over now, okay? So, we live in an instantaneous society, don't we? We, um, we don't want to wait for marriage, so we have sex. And often the consequence, well, that wasn't me, but it happens in our society. And so what happens is sometimes there's a baby, or there's sexually transmitted diseases, isn't there? We then see something that we want, and we don't want to wait and save up for it, so we put it on credit card, and then we land up in debt. We, we don't want to spend time cooking, and so we buy jars of things. I mean, my, my mother-in-law would be horrified at the amounts of jars I've put into my cooking, because she does everything from scratch. And so um, we go to McDonald's, because it's a quick feed, isn't it? And then we land up with a society that is struggling with obesity and health issues, and we wonder why. Because we, we want the quick fix. And you know what? It's, I've discovered that it's not much different within the body of Christ. There's not much difference. That we want the quick zap, the instantaneous blast. And if we don't get it, we're unwilling to face the pain of recovery. So I often hear this. So Father, I really need that husband or wife. So I'm going to go to that singles club you've got at church, and I'll give it a go for a week. And if you haven't put that husband in my, in, my, in my lap, then I'm going to make my own way. Well, I really need that promotion at work. I really do. And if I don't get it, then I'm going to take things into my own hands. You know, we heard a TED Talk the other day, and the guy was saying that the biggest problem that CEOs have these, day with, these days with their employees is the millennials, is that you've got the parents of the millennials phoning up after a month wondering why their children have not got a promotion. It's, it's quite sad, isn't it? And so we're not willing to work for things. And um, the father's saying, my child, if you cannot handle the weight of your calling when you're insignificant or single, then you'll never be able to steward it when you're significant or married. We need to be faithful in the small things before he entrusts us with much. And here's another story. I love the, the way this... So Paul Manwaring told us a story one day. It was about a friend of his who was a pastor who had gone to a conference. And um, he was at the host, the B&B, the night before. And he said to his hostess, how can I help you? Um, how can I serve you um, to assist, you know, what you're doing? And she said, you know what? It would really help me if tomorrow morning before you leave, you could take the sheets off the bed and just put them in a pile. And that will help me to know what to do with laundry. And um, he said, no problem. No worries. So the next morning, he gets up early. He wants to get to the conference. He wants that front seat. And so he gets to conference. He gets the, like the seat right at the front. He's super amped for worship. Worship starts. He's in the first song. He raises his hands. He's praising the Lord. And he hears a little voice of the Holy Spirit say, you forgot to change the sheets. So he's in this dilemma now, isn't he? Does he carry on or does he go back and change the sheets? I'm going to lose my place. I'm, not, I'm going to miss worship. I love worship. Do I go and change the sheets? So, he, you know, his integrity won over. He goes back. He changes the sheets. He comes back to the conference, and he's further back, and he misses the most of worship. Fast forward a year. He's back in his church. Someone within the congregation is suffering with stage four cancer. It's, it's really not looking good, and the church is praying and interceding, it's interceding for a miracle. And the Lord heals this person. They get radically healed. And in his quiet time, he's, this man is just saying, Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much. He's just worshiping him for the healing of his friend. And he hears the Holy Spirit say, it's because you changed the sheets. And I often think, we think it's about the big things. We think it's about this or the, how, the worship. It's not. It's about the small things. It's about having integrity with the small things. He trains us with little and with nothing so that we can be possessors of much. If we're faithful in little, he'll give us faithful in much. It's not about a formula, guys. It's about lordship. And I just, actually, this is something I felt only this morning to share with you guys. 
And it's a parable in Matthew where Jesus is talking to the people about a landowner. This might be a familiar one to you. And I think it's Matthew 20, verse 1. And he's talking about the kingdom of God is about, a, is about a landowner who went out early in the morning to find workers to work in his field. And so the story goes like this. You don't need to turn there. I'm just going to shorten it a little bit. He starts early. He sees people are sitting idle. He, he hires them to work in, on his land. They agree on the amounts of money they will be paid, and they start working. And then throughout the day, he goes out again, and the story goes that in time increments, he hires more and more people. And it's a 12-hour day, and through that period of time, he's hiring all these people. And then in verse 8, it says, When the evening had come, the landowner said to his foreman or his steward, Just line everyone up, line the laborers up, and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. Now, here's the strange part about this verse, because he could have paid those who started working first. They would have received their denarius for their hard work in the day. They would have gone away thinking, I've got a fair pay, and there would have been no problem. But instead, he lines them up, and he starts by paying the amount of money to the person who started only, and had been only working for, say, an hour, and you've got the other guys who started at six in the morning thinking, this is amazing. I'm going to be paid like double that amount, triple that amount. They're getting super excited. And then all of a sudden they realize, actually, we're all being paid the same. And, and often you can read the story and you can think, that's so unjust because it pushes our buttons of justice, doesn't it? But actually... Just get in my place. This is more about, this is not, I really believe when I was reading this, it's not about our reward in eternity. Because that is in everything we do in obedience to Christ. From the smile we give at the person at the cashier to how much we sacrifice or invest in the kingdom. This parable is about this life. And what is happening, it is dealing with how can I entrust people with a hundred times as much to do, to do what I want them to do. And so he is, is pushing issues of jealousy, isn't he? People get jealous. And what he's saying is, Janine, what does it look like to rejoice when someone else gets blessed when you need that blessing? What is the position of our hearts? Can we celebrate? Because you see, what is shown to the people is extreme grace, those who had worked just for an hour where the others got their just wages. And I often think in this world, we have extreme grace and we have just wages. What does it look like as a body to position our hearts to celebrate other people? And it's often your best friend, isn't it? You're sitting there and you're in great need and your best friend gets blessed abundantly. What is your heart saying at that time? Can I... If we can't endure the blessing when we need it the most, how are we going to endure persecution when we get the increase that we've been asking for? And I think I want us to be a body that when somebody else gets a breakthrough, we celebrate it because that's my testimony. It's not their testimony. It's my testimony. You know, when I get breakthrough, it's not mine. It's yours. You all share in my testimony. And this is what this is about. He wants us to be faithful in little, and he wants us to celebrate other people. Okay, so that was a little bit of a, a rabbit trail, but I think it was a good one. Back to what we were saying. Why do we continue to anesthetize our past, minimize it, medicate it, ignore it, and deny it? You know, it's easy to say after every service, yes and amen. And we ask for more power, and God is saying, what did you do with the power I gave you? My friend Rachel Milano, who was here last week, I asked if I could share the story. She had this huge desire for years and years to have the same healing test, um, anointing upon her life as John G. Lake. She wanted every single person that she prayed for to be instantly healed. And she prayed and she fasted and she, she did everything she knew how to do. And um, in her frustration one day, she was chatting to Bill and she said, 
Bill, I'm so frustrated. Why isn't this happening? And he said, okay, well, Rachel, just imagine tomorrow morning you wake up and every single person you pray for is instantly healed. You would have queues of people circling around the blocks waiting to be prayed for. You would have media teams outside wanting an interview. You would have people criticizing you for whatever reason, digging up your past or whatever you did. Would your soul be ready to handle it? And she sat there and she said, no, I I don't think I would. I don't think I could handle it. And she's been on a journey, and it's not necessarily healing, where God is entrusting her with so much, but that's more in the political realm. But I really believe that in this day and age, that kind of anointing is not just going to be for one person. It's for all of us as a body. We're all going to have that sense of people we pray for are going to be healed. We're all going to step out in the prophetic, in words of knowledge. It's not going to be just the people up at the front. And therefore, all the glory will go to him because no one person can take ownership of it. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, he gives us power to be witnesses. That's Um, Acts 1 verse 8, to be witnesses, not to do witnessing. You've all heard me say he, he made us human beings, not human doings. You know, if Jeff Rudge had to come to me tomorrow and say, Janine, I'm going to leave the church. Don't worry, he's not said that. But if he did, my first thought would not be, oh, no, we're going to lose an awesome life group leader. Oh, no, who am I going to call to ask help about my garden? (laughs) My first thought would be, I don't want to lose Jeff. I love the fact that when he walks into a room, he makes me feel safe. This morning, he came up to me, and he put his father's arm around me, and he looked into my eyes, and he told me how excited he was to hear me speak. I'm going to get emotional, but that's, that's what I'd miss. Who he is, not what he does. His sensitivity. I mean, I won't go on, Jeff, but you're amazing. But this is what this is what it means. How are we going to be witnesses in this world? Because power is not about self-indulgence. Power is not about spiritual elitism. It's not about Christian entertainment. It is to give us the power to be witnesses, to keep yourself pure in a world that's highly immoral. The power to have integrity in the business place to have peace in your workspace or at university where everyone else is in crazy town, the power to turn the off button on the TV. Do you know, if we really lived the lives that God intended us to live that is full of abundance, we wouldn't need to watch what the Kardashians do. It wouldn't interest us what other people do because our lives would be so full. We are called to be light in the darkness, set apart, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. It's amazing what power we could have, but most of us don't even know what it's for. And when we begin to understand what it's for in this day and age, then I believe that God is ready to unleash a whole lot more than any of us have seen or imagined. But we need to deal with our stuff, and we need to realize that revival starts from within. Now, in second year at BSSM, you have to do um, a revivalist report. It's about a 10, 15-page document on a revivalist that really impacted you or one of the generals of the faith. And James and I went to our revival group pastor, and we asked special permission if we could together do our revivalist reports on his family. Now, this may, this may be news to you, but James's heritage in his family is extraordinary. He's... I might get the nouns of greats wrong, so just bear with me. I think it's great, great, great granny went to China and even aunt, aunt. You see, I wasn't focusing on my revivalist reports. No, I did get a good mark. So anyway, she went to China and had contact with Hudson Taylor. And then she also went to the Solomon Islands, which is just off Australia, and brought revival to those islands. Now, they were cannibals. I mean, a a woman on her own going to these islands to bring the love of Jesus. And to this day, there's actually a Bible college on those islands. And James and I, one of our dreams is to go and visit one day because it's part of our heritage. But the thing that impacted me the most when I read the book called Fire on the Islands is that when revival was breaking out, when the Holy Spirit was breaking out, 
people lived with short accounts. Like if, if the leaders had one slight negative thought about someone else, they would instantly go to that person and say, brother, forgive me. I had this thought, I don't want to live in offense. Forgive me. And you know, this is easy to talk about, but it's not easy when it happens to you. And I love it when you're about to preach on something, how the Father brings things into your life the week before to challenge you. Because this happened to me this week. Somebody I love deeply and I honor and respect brought correction into my life. And I'm sitting across the table from this person and they're talking to me. And instantly, my flesh man wants to rise up and justify my actions. Who's been in that place before? I'm just being real, guys. I told you, leaders aren't perfect. But in the moment that I'm feeling that, the Holy Spirit is coming with a soft voice and saying, my child, correction is coming beautifully through this person. Listen to me. And that's the place where you humble yourself and you say, I'm so sorry I messed up. And it's beautiful when you do that because instantly there's the forgiveness. Instantly you have that connection in relationship again. Because when there's things between people, it causes disconnection. We want to be connected to our Father. We want to be connected to people because then a revival is going to break out. And you know what? This is not a striving thing, guys. We don't have to strive. In the Word of God, it says we have no obligation to our sinful nature anymore. We don't. We can live like this. We, seat in, we are seated in heavenly places. I think James prayed that this morning. We are seated in heavenly places. We can walk in that level of holiness. And I believe God is calling us as a body to up our level of holiness. So he wants us to apply what we've heard and what we've been taught. Because he's not changing his book. He's not changing his instruction. How are we going to step into freedom and wholeness is to actually do what the Word says. You see, what the enemy intended for our lives, God has turned around, is working for good. Now, does that mean that everything that has happened in your life was good? Absolutely not. And I believe that the Father sits in heaven and he weeps over some of the things that happens to his children. But he is able to work all the bad things that have happened or taken place in our lives and work it together for good. Romans 8.28, we know it well, says that he will work all things together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. I've seen this time and time again. When I was at school, there was a girl who um, was kidnapped, got into sex trafficking and prostitution. I mean, the things that happened to her were... were I mean, I can't even begin to explain, but God worked every single thing for good because she was willing to deal with her stuff and embrace the pain of recovery. And today, she is working amongst women who've been sex trafficked. She's got a message because she's lived it. It's beautiful to see. The very thing that the enemy has tried to use against you is the very thing in your quiver that you will take ground in the kingdom for. The very thing that you think will disqualify you is the very thing that will qualify you for what God has called you to do. For years and years, I disqualified myself because of stuff in my life. I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I've got this habitual sin. How am I ever going to speak about it? How am I ever going to be free? People are going to know. They're going to see. You know, especially the prophets, you know, when they look at you with those eyes, they're going to tell. I would be so afraid of going for any, I remember in South Africa, we had a prophetic presbytery and um, I was petrified. I was like, they're going to call me up because they know. But God's not like that. He's so good. He calls us out to the, the plan that he's got for us. Before we were even born and in our mother's womb, the father sang a song over our lives of the people he wanted us to be. And that's what he continues to sing over our lives again and again. He doesn't look at our stuff. He looks at the person he's called us to be. So in conclusion, we need to build our lives on the truth of the word. If you abide in the word, then you will know the truth. And guess what? The truth will set you. Amen. We need to stop abiding in Oprah and Dr. Phil, in Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, politics, 
but we need to be abiding in the Word of God. Let's abide in His truth, deal with our stuff, and we will know freedom and walk in all that He has for us individually and as a body. So my question again, coming back to those frogs, are we going to deal with our frogs today so we can walk in freedom tomorrow? Amen.